2024. We're going to record this one. Uh, so there are a lot of people have shown interest in joining. If they can't do it, we want to share the recording. So if you have any problems of recording, let us know. So before we start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So clinical education is very important and clinical teachers are a vital part of any medical school. We need to bring them together to support them, mentor them and upskill them. So with this intention, we started the Academy of Clinical Education in Newcastle in 2017 with lots of help from Brian Kelly and Brian Jolly. They both are here tonight. So we have over 480 people who are the members of the Academy now. 175 people have finished the certificate in clinical teaching, including assessment. Another 175 are in the various stages of the program, including finishing the last assessment module. So that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for all the tutors and uh, people who are supporting the program. So we have done this, but there are other models we can learn from. So that's why we thought we should have this uh, webinar today. And I'll hand over to Brian Kelly to introduce the speaker and, uh, and start the start the webinar. Brian. Well, thank you so much, Kichu, and uh, welcome everybody this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I'm meeting from here today, and the Awabakal people, and, uh, and, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining this meeting today. Um, we've got great privilege tonight of um, having a, a speaker, Professor Q Chang Lee from the University of California, San Francisco. I'll say a little bit about Professor Lee's experience and background, but uh, really want to thank him for his generous contribution to a range of uh, initiatives and uh, discussions that have occurred over the time that he's been spending here in Australia, which has uh, been invaluable. We've just left a discussion on, on professionalism that we're having with Miriam Gotowski, our professionalism lead, but he's contributed to a number of other uh, important discussions during this time and hopefully it's uh, really fostered a, a very productive collaboration which will be ongoing between our organisations. Uh, professor Lee is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioural Science at the University of California, San Francisco and a highly experienced clinical educator. Um, has led a number of initiatives within the University of California, San Francisco Medical School where he serves as an endowed chair in psychiatry medical education, but is also the program director of the Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Fellowship Program and the Psychiatry Clerkship Director. So a lot of experience in uh, medical student and uh, ongoing professional education there in psychiatry, but he contributes more broadly to the medical education program at UCSF. He's based at the San Francisco Veterans Affairs Healthcare System, where he's the director of the psychiatry consultation unit and the associate chief of psychiatry. He has a range of interests, including, uh, as I said, medical education, but also uh, clinical reasoning in professionalism and particularly diversity, equity and inclusion in medical education. He also has a significant role in the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Fellowship Education Subcommittee in the US and is a, a member of their board of directors. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and Q, you might want to say more, but um, I think you'll, you'll uh, hear more from Q and, and also, um, I, th I, th I think, be able to see the benefit of his depth of experience in the field. So over to you, Professor Lee. Uh, thanks very much, Brian and Kichu. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I can't uh, tell you how uh, welcome I've felt by everyone I met here at the university, and I want to express my gratitude to Brian and Kichu in particular. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. I, I, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I'm really excited to learn more about your academy. I'll be, I'm here to tell you more about what my academy is doing, um, but really with an eye to, um, to growing our community of clinician educators and having a sense of community uh, within our institutions and across institutions. So um, with that, and then, oh, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to um, enter them in the chat. Uh, and um, 
we're you know a small group today so um if you also want to you know just ask a question this it's fine it's, it's this is very informal so i'll just uh share my slides here with you hopefully successfully okay Great, they're there, they're now. Okay. Yes, we can see them. Great, so, thanks. Um, so uh, here I just want to point out the, um, there are two photos. The one on top is UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco, where I'm a faculty member and where I teach. That's the main campus. Um, and then the lower photo is that of the San Francisco Veterans Affairs Medical Center. We serve the veteran population in the San Francisco area. Um, that's where I'm clinically based. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're federal we're a federal institution, so being the federal government, they have a very prime piece of real estate in San Francisco with this beautiful view of the Golden Gate Bridge. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. So what I'd like to talk about today is what I might call the dark past of medical education at UCSF. So much will be revealed to you who are present today <laughs> watching the recording. Um, and then I'll talk more about our Academy of Medical Educators. It's named after the dean who uh, was very, was, was our, the dean of the medical school when the academy was started. He was extremely supportive of clinician educators. His name is Hilly T. DeVos. We'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our framework, our mission and vision, who we are, and then some of our events and our programs. I'm really keen to hear more about your uh, events. I've been very, very impressed, really, by the commitment to medical education and achievements I've seen at your university over these last couple of months. Um, things like the certificate program and, um, and the size of your Academy, it really speaks volumes to um, how fantastic uh, you all are with respect to really valuing education and, and, and being uh, committed to that. So then we'll have an opportunity for breakout groups. This is really will be an opportunity for you to talk more about your ideas. I, I don't know how often you have a chance to do this, uh, but your ideas about how to um, what you might like to see the academy, your academy doing, how we can be helpful to each other. Um, and uh, and um, then we'll break out to a larger group and uh, talk about that, and we'll have time for uh, Q and A as well. I just want to uh, make a couple of acknowledgments. Um, Anne Ponsley, she's uh, the current director of our academy, and she's also the William G. Irwin Endowed Chair in the Department of Neurology. So is Kathleen Land, who is our academy's program manager. They very graciously. Um, allowed me to um, utilize these slides and share them with you uh, today. So just for context, uh, University of California, San Francisco, sorry, is one of a number of institutions within the UC system, including UC Berkeley, UCLA. Um, we're unusual in that we have no undergraduate students. We're entirely a graduate institution, which consists of graduate division, as well as four health sciences schools, those of dentistry, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy. So while UCSF has a strong reputation as an academic institution, um, currently that hasn't always been that way. Back in the 1960s, UCSF was considered a good regional university and we did have a medical school. And of course we have in the US as you do in Australia, the, the oversight body um, to ensure or accredit uh, medical schools. And so ours is called the Liaison Committee on Medical Education or the LCME. And in their site visit in 1964, they reported a quote, failure to find stimulating, progressive, exciting, forward-looking thinking expected in a school located a community otherwise full of vitality of surging growth. Absence of deep positive commitment to an educational philosophy as a matter of concern to the survey team, to the university, the profession, and the taxpayer. Um, and so, you know, a reference there to the taxpayer because, uh, of course, we are a public institution. However, from the 1970s through the 90s, there was a rapid ascent in the reputation and the quality of the clinical care and re uh, research that UCSF undertook, uh, that largely with the help of increased funding from our National Institute of Health. There were multiple seminal discoveries by UCSF faculty during this time, including the discovery of prions and oncogenes. There were pioneers in DNA technology during this time and a national recognition in many clinical domains, including graduate programs, transplantation, neurology, neurosurgery, pediatrics, women's health, and AIDS care. Um, and there was an improvement in the quality of the education as well. But despite that, in 1996, 
when the LCMA came to visit, they described our curriculum as a, quote, headless monster because no one appeared to be in charge. So uh, in response to that, uh, Haley T. DeBoss, our dean of the medical school, uh, appointed not one, but two curriculum task forces, one called Blue Skies, led by Dan Lowenstein in neurology, the other called Green Pastures, <laughs> led by Molly Cook. And uh, you know, I think his idea was to see how you know, what these two different task forces might come up with with respect to revamping our, our curriculum. One of the ideas from the Blue Skies Task Force, and this was in 98, was to establish the Academy of Medical Educators. And in January of 1999, this idea was endorsed by our department chairs at Dean's Re Leadership Retreat. Two months later, Dean DeBoss announced financial support for operations and matched chair program. I mean, the departmental chair has also uh, put up funding to start the academy. Um, and then in August 2000, Molly Cook of Department of Medicine was appointed the director. A year later, we inducted our first 24 members. And you can see we've only had two directors since uh, Molly. Uh, Anne has been in her current position uh, for the last eight years. And think about our framework, and I imagine it's very similar to your framework. We think of our framework in terms of four domains, the first being advocacy. So uh, our academy being a unique voice for education mission, the education mission within UCSF, also an advocate for advancement and promotion of our faculty, particularly those who are clinician educators. Um, and so uh, that's one domain. The second domain is career development, being a strategic and generative unit for this, and being a resource for what it takes to be an educator within our academic setting. Third, there's scholarship, where our members contribute the key interface of innovation and academic output. And then finally, innovation itself, uh, to which our academy devotes resources, including human capital as well as money. Um, and we think of innovation in this sphere as discovery specifically to advance teaching and learning. Our mission statement is to support the people who carry out and advance the education mission of UCSF. Our values are those of community, diversity, advocacy, service, and innovation. And our vision is to promote an organizational culture that values educators and accelerates advances in teaching and learning to improve health. And I think the key, so the key words here are organizational culture, right? We want to really instill a culture across the organization to, um, to value medical educator, education, not within just one program or school um, or, or among one set of stakeholders. So currently, our academy has 256 members from our four uh, schools, um, so fewer members than yours. Um, we do have a, a application process and a selection process, um, but our members come from our seven from seven core teaching sites, including UCSF Fresno. That's uh, that's our that's where we focus on rural medicine. Um, also, Mission Bay, Mount Zion, and Parnassus. Those are UC institutions within the city of San Francisco. Our Veterans uh, Affairs Medical Center. Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, which is our community hospital, and then as well, and then also Kaiser Permanente, which is a uh, health maintenance organization or HMO, a very large one uh, in the U.S. We represent 29 interprofessional clinical and basic science departments, and then we have, and we are very fortunate to have three core staff members working for the academy within the umbrella organization of the Center for Faculty Educators and that's UCSF's um, Center for Faculty Development. We also have one qualitative education research assistant co-funded with the CFE. So our annual events, um, and I'd love to hear more about uh, some of your events. We every year have a celebration of new members. Um, and so when they're inducted, we have a speaker. This past year, that was Michelle Albert, who is our Associate Dean for Admissions. She spoke about dismantling structural racism in medical training. Um, every year we have a fall meeting. This year it was in person, uh, and we had we we conducted in two different sites with Salim Razak and the uh, uh, Professor Salim Razak. He's at the University of Vancouver. He spoke about uh, expanding our educational practice in medical education from uh, an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, and intersectionality point of view. We also had winter site-based meetings every year. Um, the recent one was on the joy of mentorship, which was really fantastic, um, hosted by our own mentoring action group. And then we had a summer meeting that focused on educational technology that was hosted by our 
Educational Technology Interest Group. So you can see that our our meetings uh, really are intramural. You know that that, that the that the speakers largely come from um, our uh, our own action or interest groups or committees. Some of the programs that serve our institution include teaching and staff awards. <clears throat> I'm sure that you have similar awards. You know, I think this is really a fantastic way to acknowledge people, make people feel part of our community. Um, and, um, and then we also offer mentorship and career support, faculty development. We have an education showcase every year. And if you have something like this, I'd love to hear more about that. As I mentioned, we have committees and action and interest groups, including a DEI committee, that being diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. We also have an innovations funding program to help fund scholarship uh, devoted to medical education, and then a match and AME endowed chair program. I'll say a little bit more about that, but that's the that's a program that's the program that's helping fund my visit here at the University of Newcastle. I'm the endowed chair of psychiatry uh, medical student education. So I really want to highlight our awards because again, this is a really fantastic way to help. People feel recognized. We have they're all peer nominated, um, and these awards highlight outstanding frontline teachers at all of our sites uh, who might otherwise go unrecognized. We have a, awards in excellence in teaching and in mentoring, as well as one in interprofessional teaching, really to highlight the importance of interprofessional teaching and the unique skills required to do that well. That award is co-sponsored with the Program for Interprofessional Practice and Education, or PIPE, at UCSF. We also have staff recognition awards. One is called the Boyden Award. This recognizes exemplary service by staff that support health professionals education. And we all absolutely recognize the value of this. Um, staff can come from any background. We have three awards that are given, one for those who've been with us for less than five years, one for more than five years, also a team award. Um, and then we have an exceptional service in medical education award as well. Again, an individual award and a team award. One thing that the Academy has really um, emphasized and disseminate, disseminated, promoted is what we call an educator's portfolio. I don't know if the, uh, your Academy or university has something like this, but this is uh, a portfolio that helps faculty make visible their most important contributions in education among five potential roles, those being teaching, mentoring and advising, curriculum development and instructional design, educational leadership and learner assessment. And the idea is that each faculty member who develops a portfolio drafts uh, uh, their role using a template that's unique to the role. The educa educator's portfolio also includes an edu executive summary of the individual's most significant contributions to education. Um, and I think you know, we do require a portfolio for those who are applying to the academy. Uh, it's a really a nice way to catalog your achievements and have a look of sort of wh what you've accomplished and what you'd like to do going forward and opportunity to reflect on that. Another nice thing at UCSF is that you we are we're able to upload our portfolio into our uh, platform for advancement so that when we are up for promotion, our educational uh, achievements can be all in one place and highlighted using this portfolio. We also have uh, a peer observation feedback program uh, that we call TOP. Um, and the teach observation program. The idea here is to provide peer observation of teaching and feedback in a safe and supportive environment. Um, the idea is to focus on what the faculty member, member identifies as a need in their teaching. So we have a roster of people who are, have been quote, approved by the academy to be observers and to provide this feedback. Mm -hmm. Faculty members who are interested enroll in the top and then they select an observer, they arrange a meeting to discuss what they would like to focus on and in, in which teaching setting they're going to be observed, then they participate in the observation. Then they meet again to uh, receive confidential feedback from their observer. Uh, and then if they'd like, they can also request documentation from the academy to add uh, for their, to their CV or to send as a letter to educational leadership or their chair. You know, really recognize, I think we all, all know that giving and receiving feedback can be challenging due to time, or especially if it's constructive feedback, and that it's really valuable for um, faculty members to enroll in something like this and perhaps make it themselves a little bit vulnerable, and and uh, that then we'd like that to be recognized uh, by others. I mentioned that we put on an education showcase every year. I'd love to hear if you have something like this as well. Um, and we have a similar thing actually within our VA, 
Uh, but we have one at UCSF across all sites. Uh, that's That happens every May. This is a uh, collaboration with our Center for Faculty Educators, um, Faculty Development and Education Research Teams. This last year, we had over 150 participants, uh, six workshops and 79 abstracts. And, and the idea is really to highlight accomplishments or achievements in scholarly work related to medical education and curricula. Uh, our keynote address was by John Young, who's photograph is here. He's the uh, chair of psychiatry at Hofstra University in New York State, was also a resident at UCSF, a resident of mine. He spoke about applying decolonial practice in health professions and education research. Then one of his areas of expertise is in cognitive load theory. And so there was a panel discussion about research with people, experts from the Western University in London, Ontario. This is a slide that just that shows some articles that have been published about our academy and other uh, clinician educator academies uh, by uh, members of the UCSF Haley T. DeVos Academy uh, and other colleagues at UCSF. We have an innovations funding program, um, again, to fund intramurally scholarly projects devoted to medical education related to that. Um, it provides grants for the development of new curricular programs and promotion of constructive curricular change. Um, in the 22 years that this may exist, we've awarded over four and a half million dollars. You can see here um, that we funded in the last six years or so, uh, 124 projects uh, representing 107 unique PIs, 25 departments and all four schools. Um, the AME, of course, can't do that alone. So this is funded by a number of programs and stakeholders, as you can see here across UCSF, as well as the AME endowed chairs, um, who some some of whom also devote funding to support this program. There was a study done about the impact of this program, and they found that our intramural medical issue grants provided enhanced advancement opportunities and and, and enhanced the local and national identity uh, identity of the recipients. It helped to create innovative, enduring programs and support faculty in their academic growth. And also, I think very importantly, helped to create and foster the development of an educational community. I'll just say a couple of words about the endowed chair program since I'm a part of that. Um, all of the endowed chairs have a five-year term, which are renewal once. It's proposal-based. So in other words, people have to apply. You must be academy member to be eligible and it is a competitive selection process. We have 20 endowed chairs that are departmentally matched, meaning that the AME funds half of the endowment and the department funds the other half. We also have four that are uh, funded entirely by the academy. And so these allow uh, AME members to expand their impact at UCSF and beyond. And it provides a limited discretionary income stream for new, what we might call value added educational work. Um, the slide says limited, but I have to say it's to me, it's very, very generous. It's really a rare opportunity for clinician educators to have this kind of income to really engage in uh, projects of what of, of interest to them related to medical education. So I feel extremely, extremely fortunate. Um, they did a qualitative research project or some colleagues did on the impact of this program. Um, and uh, five things were identified, the first being symbolism, uh, really the uh, the way the the fact that the endowed chair lended credibility to the faculty member as a clinician educator and recognized their commitment and was also a symbol to their leaders and their chairs. Of course, the chair provides resources. Um, also a theme was uh, helping the recipient grow as an educator, but not only that to also help uh, uh, advocate for the, educational or professional growth of other faculty members, of faculty colleagues. I've, for example, supported a number of colleagues to attend conferences related to medical education or help them uh, with, uh, for example, um, lunches that help, lunches specific to underrepresented minority trainees, things like that. So that was another theme of really uh, enhancing or advocating. Um, and then the personal and professional development, of course, of both the recipient, but again, also helping the professional development of colleagues, um, and that the um, and that the impact of this chair really included things like you know being able to add have an academic metric to add to their CV, really advancing uh, people's careers, and in some cases developing curricula or programs that have been sustained beyond the term of the chair. 
I'll just say a couple words about um, another paper here. You know, I want to acknowledge that you know UCSF is very fortunate to have uh, a, a, you know, a, an unusually large amount of money, I think, devoted to our academy and to other similar programs. And that's not the case at, at many institutions uh, with the recognition that you know, these programs and these academies, and I'm sure all of you will agree, are not programs that uh, make a profit or make money for the institution um, if, they, if, if, they, if they make any money at all. Um, and so really, we, our leaders, our institutional leaders need to be thinking about the value of these, of our academies uh, in different ways. And so we interviewed, or not we, but our, my colleagues interviewed institutional leaders about these values, what we call value factors in five domains. And the themes that came out in these domains, first, the individual factors that institutional leaders really felt that this was important to develop people's career and their statue, as well as their personal professional development. Um, there is a financial piece that besides money, that time needs to be provided. And you know, I think we can all agree that that can be as much a barrier as financial resources, if not a greater barrier. Um, that these programs can attract further resources and recognize that money in these situations are really part of input and not necessarily output. Um, the operational domain, uh, pr uh, um, providing educational programs that can actually enhance efficiency and also can be really helpful in faculty recruitment and retention. The social and societal domain, disse disseminating these activities, both externally and internally, and then the strategic and political domain really have these a commitment to these academies. To us as clinician educators reflects uh, a culture and a, a symbolism uh, that others can see uh, visibly. Um, this can lead to innovation and organizational success. Looking forward with respect to our academy, uh, the we ha, are going to be uh, focusing our efforts in supporting a new Academy Mentoring Action Group. Um, I mentioned that they uh, hosted one of our winter site-based meet meetings last year. We also have a financial interest group that's relatively new. This group uh, really looks at ways to see how we can better finance as an institution, um, educational scholarship or the activities of clinician educators. We have a technology interest group. When they spoke at our meeting uh, last fall, they discussed, the focus was on AI, which is very, very interesting. We also have a new, relatively new collaboration with the Aga Khan University Teaching Academy um, in Pakistan. And so we are working with them uh, to collaborate on some of their activities, including their membership selection process. Um, we also have had for several years now an ongoing engagement in anti-racism, anti-oppression initiatives. And then we're beginning to explore racial affinity learning groups, having members of, uh, of the same race or ethnicity meet on a regular basis to discuss perspectives and issues related to medical education um, as, as a group. So with that, I might pause and see if there are any questions or comments or thoughts. I'd love to hear more about also what uh, your academy is doing along these lines or what you, what ideas you might have. Um, we'll talk about this in breakout groups as well, but any, um, any sort of initial reactions? Any questions or comments? I was just going to say it's uh, yeah, very inspiring, especially the um, uh, like the encouragement that um, some of the systems of prizes uh, and, and 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 working together to acknowledge successes and and whatnot. I think that's um, a really good culture to build, and that sort of fits in nice to the framework that you've highlighted for us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. <laughs> Hi, Professor Lee. Uh, yes, I, I was also very much inspired about how how structured, well structured your academy uh, is, uh, and and the approach of uh, that funding is is really good. I think uh, you have so many different activities to offer, uh, and it's really an inspiration for us. Well, thanks so much, Tame. Again, I feel very very fortunate. Um, uh, Nora, you have your hand up. 
Yes, hello. Um, I actually wanted to highlight an initiative that you didn't mention, but that I know of. Oh, uh, fantastic. <laughs> UCSF is running HPE Global. Um, Timothy Dyster is running it, which is a class that runs um, online and it talks about maker education, uh, scholarship and innovation. And I attend the sort of the time zone that best suits um, uh -huh. on Friday mornings. The other one is unfortunately Thursday at 2 a.m., so I can't. <laughs> and we have a lot of other participants from the Southern Hemisphere, and it's quite nice to hear, um, you know, on an international scale, different perspectives on medical education. And it's such a lovely, friendly program. And yes, it's run by UCSF. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear, Nora. I'm so glad that you're engaged in, with that program, that you're learning from it. And thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for the what we call a shout out to UCSF. <laughs> really appreciate it. Any other thoughts or comments? Um, all right, then. Um, uh, I'll. Um, I thought that then perhaps uh, we could uh, have some breakout groups to discuss more. Um, and uh, I have some prompts. Um, you don't shouldn't feel beholden to these prompts, but uh, but I thought some of the things that might be interested to discuss or what I might um, what we might all be interested in hearing about sort of what ideas do you have to help further the goals of your academy? Um, what would you be interested in engaging in as a member of the ACE that doesn't perhaps exist now? Um, what barriers do you see in implementing your ideas and how could you address them or how might you strategize around that? And how can your academy collaborate with other academies, uh, including ours at UCSF, to achieve mutual goals? Um, and so I think we'll have what ten or how many? How long do you we think we have? Four groups, five four groups. Okay. Uh, or, or I can create three because um, it will be good discussion because we'll have uh, at least uh, five in five to six in each. Hmm. Okay. And so, then how long do you think? Which but one, one, two, three, four, four topics. A breakout group so okay uh so if you want to do that uh, i'll just yeah, read then one group each group can talk about one issue okay so, uh i have recreated the rooms and and then do we know which group then will address which question Yep. So, uh, so uh, group one uh, address the first question, then the uh, second, third, fourth. So we'll we'll go in sequence. Okay. Uh, I'll just recreate the room. We have we had a few participants who left. So just yep. I'll open the rooms now. Please join the rooms, and then we'll do maybe the six thirty-five. How long do you think? 10, 15? Uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, uh, we'll do 12 minutes then. <laughs> <laughs> Please then join the room. Will they know the question they're going to talk? Yes, I'll, I'll post that in the broadcast. Yeah, very good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Tommy, for your help with that. No, no problem for I appreciate it. It's, it's good. Uh, Kichu, you sir, you can also join one room. I'll go into room two. I I am um, for some In reason room I joined a group and then I then I managed to join myself out of it. But oh that's okay because I've had, had one uh I've, I, I need to go anyway, but I had one um, question, really. How did you manage to get so much funding? Uh, you know, it's a great question, Brian. And I think that, you know, it started with our initial dean. So most of the funding really is does come from the School of Medicine, um, and uh, which is, uh, and even though we serve all four schools, there was a commitment from our initial, from Haley T. DeBoss, as well as in the, and and the department chairs, so um, you know we have twenty department chair or twenty endowed chairs, for example. So we also have departments again, almost all entirely from the Department of Medicine, who have helped fund the academy, and that has continued. But you know, 
it's it's a it's a good question because we basically serve at the pleasure of the dean or we exist at the pleasure of the dean right uh -huh. right like you know if you have a dean who doesn't really value what the academy is doing yeah. that, that, then they so, don't uh, they... sorry professor lee uh, can you post the uh, questions or in the chat uh, the ones so that i can i can put it in the broadcast oh yeah 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 sure, sure sure so you just copy paste those questions in the yeah. chat box yeah. and can post so anyway Brian, we're thinking about ways to sort of increase philanthropy things like that but it's really yeah. primarily because the dean and department chairs at the medical school support oh, that's very good thanks yeah you bet um, thanks for joining us oh, that's, yeah it's okay i um <laughs> i was always in a situation when we started the academy in newcastle of yeah and and keisha will be able to talk to this later um we had no funding at all virtually yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's, 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 that's, it's, um, we're very lucky, as I said, to have that kind of funding, but, um, but, uh, you know, I recognize the challenges involved with that. And I think it's really fantastic. Yeah, that the yeah. Academy has grown as much as it has. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's, um, uh, Tanmay, I'm sorry, I've got to go, but, um, okay. thank, uh, you. thank you for joining, uh, Brian. That's, that's all right. Yeah. I, re I really enjoyed the first half hour. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it, Brian. Thanks again for joining. Thanks. Thanks. See ya. See, See ya. Bunmi, can you join uh, room four? Sorry, I was in a meeting. So um, someone just called me and it was uh -huh. important. So that's why oh, I okay. went out. Yeah. Sorry about that. Is it all right if I just stay here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of joining, I'm already late. Mm -hmm. I just broadcast the uh, questions. That's two questions. Uh, can you also say that third question and fourth? Fourth. Does each group get a question? Yeah, that's how yeah. you said it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I didn't set it up that way, but could you? That's 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 how you set it up. So that's fine. So what? When will the? When will they come back? On me? Uh, I think and uh, we can give them around five minutes because they are just small, smaller groups. Yeah, 645. That's great. Yeah. 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 yeah they have one. This question. And then they, they'll have some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Bunmi, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> nice to see you. This will be the last time I see you before I leave. Oh, yeah. Oh, how but was your trip you. to Japan? Oh, it was fantastic. Oh, I thought of you. Yeah. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm really excited to hear about um, what you discussed in the groups. This is maybe selfishly <laughs> for me to learn um, about what you all are doing, what ideas you have, and um, and maybe ideas that I can take back to my academy as well. So um, why don't we start off at the top? And I, really, I, I hopefully someone from each group can can give a little report out, but I'd love to hear thoughts from everybody or anybody about um, these four different questions. Um, so, cause they're all related, right? So, so first um, was sort of what ideas um, do you have uh, for furthering the goals of your academy? And if someone from group one wants to talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. I'm happy to. Thanks. Um, but yeah, I'm sure the others, Jess and Delape will add, but, um... So we, we actually focused on uh, uh, on focused on peer observation as a ah. good thing that we'd done at some point, but it had sort of gone by the wayside and we fo and, and you know Jess was really um, remember some really good benefits from it and we were impressed to see that it was really embedded as part of your um, system there. Uh, we sort of we talked to we spoke about some of the barriers to. You know, lack of resourcing for it, but, and then 
I talked about some small group um, techniques that I've uh, enjoyed doing with things like action learning sets or step back techniques where you've got people presenting a challenge and how and 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 having in different ways uh, the rest of the group sort of helping to move you along towards a goal um a goal like implementing you know some sort of system of peer learning and then delete brought up the, the the possibility of actually embedding that in the um promotion culture of the mm -hmm. institution like yeah. making sure that peer observation is recognized as something yeah. really great for colleagues to do for each other and that actually could um give it a life of its own so we had a little bit of problem solving there around a sort of a vision i like that a lot yeah <laughs> that's great graham yeah that's one of the reasons i want to highlight that it's something that i think um can easily fall by the wayside um right and so i think that uh, if, if 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 we pay attention to that and have an actual some, a program in some, some way that is embedded as you point out in terms of uh, professional growth or advancement, that that's, that can really help enhance all of our skills. And then, of course, then our learners um, benefit and then, you know, their patients benefit. So, which is, of course, the goal. Of, um, so, um, so great. I love hearing about that, Graham. Thank you for sharing that. Jeez. Other thoughts from anybody about... Any other ideas or... Um... I've forgotten what question we were answering. I'm sorry. That was still number one, <laughs> but why don't we move on to number two, which was Tom may do. <laughs> I think now, oh, what, what, act, what activities would you be interested in engaging in, in the academy? Yeah. Okay. So that's the question. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our group was talking about the um, importance of the evidence base, learning more about the evidence base mm -hmm. behind teaching and learning, clinical mm -hmm. teaching and learning, mm -hmm. and that um, it, we tend to teach in the way that we were taught. And so it's important to know uh, what evidence is coming through for new generations of learners, what we need to do to adapt our learning style. And we were talking about that um, excellent um, session that we had had about you know generation z and the new learners um style we talked about um, mentorship um of each other and also um about learning about ways to support students who are from disadvantaged backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, from culturally perhaps more vulnerable backgrounds mm -hmm. um, and learning to to teach in a culturally supportive way and a way in which retention uh, can happen for those cohorts so if I've missed something please jump in but that's what we talked about I love all of those ideas. All of those would be th things that I would be also interested in engaging in. But really, I think highlights some of the some of the uh, some of what you know you your group felt um, was really um, you know, in terms of maybe prioritizing or what really makes you excited <laughs> about being clinician educators is learning more about the evidence based opportunities for mentorship and also really uh, finding ways to. Um, enhance or the, uh, the educational experiences of those um, who've been traditionally disadvantaged or coming from different cultural backgrounds. If I if I've said that correctly, so Kitchu, you have some work to do <laughs> um, about maybe thinking about racialize those things, you know, and um, um, and um, yeah, it's that that would that I I would love to, that that would be something um, to really think about. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And that being said, though, what are some of the barriers um, maybe in trying to implement or, um, you know, add to the activities of the academy or help it grow? So that was a question that our group has okay. focused on. Great. <laughs> group three, question three. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and, that, and we focus more on the clinical context. So uh, it's we really think that we need to have dedicated time for it. So uh, clinic routine or hospital routine is uh, prohibiting, uh, especially junior doctors to attend mm -hmm. to teaching events and uh, they miss out because it's just too busy. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked that uh, nomination uh, for, you know, 
appreciation. I don't think that's happening in in our institution, is it? Or have I missed that? Um, and uh, funding for education events is definitely something that is missing in our institution as well. Yeah. Uh, over all time, most educational events are in the evening or on the weekend. And, mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. they're not embedded in in your work day. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, we're getting busier and busier and busier. It's so true. That's true at UCSF too. So that's something that's definitely um, is a similarity across our institutions. And, um, and um, you know, it, it feels, it does feel increasingly difficult, you know, that the trend is, um, is the, for, towards productivity is making it harder. Um, so we're experiencing that too, Jenna. And any thoughts about how to maybe address these? Um, you know, I think, I love yes, that you brought the awards. We yeah. said you should, I mean, our department has a, a teaching day, more or less, with seven o'clock um, breakfast, uh, journal, <laughs> then uh, a clinical meeting, a neuroradiology meeting in the afternoon. But I've also noticed that the junior doctors that should learn and they're only on the neurology rotation for a couple of weeks often miss out because it's yeah. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yes. uh, go ahead, could you? Or on who, this, uh, on this um, point, um, Kyu Chang, you asked what solutions can we think of? Um, here at the Central Coast Clinical School, we have a group of junior doctors that runs a near peer teaching educate near peer medical teaching group, and since they recognize also these barriers that they all have, um, they've just reached out and we are working together to create some foundational online modules on the basics, on the evidence, I would say, of clinical teaching. So that is an initiative that hopefully will facilitate their engagement, but it's always a balance because um, teaching should be an interaction and teaching mm -hmm. is best when it's dialogic. Mm -hmm. But when you create an online module, you are inherently mm -hmm. creating a detachment there. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, might help. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, baby steps and, you know, I think that are small, thinking about things that are low hanging fruit, right? And so, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's possible, something like, you know, we have this education so showcase, but having a day dedicated to Christian educators where you might have speakers on evidence-based, you know, um, or, you know, something that's planned in advance and where you could try to get buy-in from senior um, you know, saying that this is something we want to do for one day that maybe we could release the more junior people. And obviously not everyone could make it, but, you know, something like that. Maybe you're doing something like that already. I do love the idea of the awards. You know, it's really, you don't have to, um, it's not, you don't have to give people money necessarily. I mean, some of our awards do, I think for the staff they do, but, you know, I think they 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 really value the, achieve the recognition more than the, than the money. And so that's, I think, something that I think maybe to consider um so those are some of the so so again you know i love this discussion um and uh and there are barriers and time is one of them it really is and i and i, I acknowledge that so and uh, uh, professor yeah, lee okay. uh, at your institute do you uh do you give cpd points for like some uh, some trainings if they have attended uh through the through your academy uh, and that could be something which can which can motivate people to attend uh, training workshops mm -hmm. or or do the online modules uh, like what Nora has highlighted. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's absolutely true. That's right. So, um, so yeah. So you know, I think that th these are things that you want to actively be thinking about and discussing with. Again, this is again about buying right from our senior, your senior leadership, our senior leadership, um, and so um, so. That's 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 definitely food for thought, Brian. Yes, uh, thanks. Q. I was just going to say, I think in the past we have had teaching awards uh, that have been part of the academy, and um, that's certainly something uh, you know I, I can imagine would be, yeah we need to be looked at. But the other thing I was going to say is that this issue of online, the sort of request you're talking about, Nora, I can see one of the roles of the academy being. Uh, being able to assist with a request like that. What's the need that sits behind it? Is an online module the answer or is there some other way that that can be um, addressed? Because there are no end of online modules on things um, and they sit there and they gather dust. So, you know, what, to provide a forum to res respond to questions or issues that come up, 
and look at giving advice about the best way of doing that. Um, and it reminds me, and perhaps it segues into the last question that Nora and I are in the group together about, about linking with academies. One of our, I suppose it's a way of thinking about the academy, but our major partner in all of this is our health services. Mm -hmm. And that I would see that as being um, an important arm of the academy is the, the connection with them as our, you know, this industry partnership, which is very much part of how universities are working. But our industry, our, our, our sort of uh, key partner here is other other health districts, the health services, um, our general practitioners, and looking at how do we address the sorts of issues that Jeanette's describing of embedding education more mm -hmm. effectively there so that what can be done within the reality of the time pressures. So the things like the one minute preceptor model, just an example that comes to mind, being effective as a teacher within the limits and pressures of your day-to-day -day work, but also looking at how do we promote the culture where teaching is and education is valued as the tool to maintaining best possible clinical practice and mm -hmm. changing clinical practice. Um, and so that that's an academy relationship, which I think is is really important. And we also talked about this issue of um, collaborations with other academies and maybe where that is, there's an opportunity to do that for it to be very focused on particular project or areas of interest because it then makes the collaboration more meaningful and productive. So it may be cue that we reach out to collaborate with your very successful and impressive group on a particular area where we can be um, we can learn, but also we might have something to contribute. And the other thing we talked about was that, you know, you've got such a, a fantastic um, model there and, and beautifully resourced and a rich history. Um, we're not going to get there. Rome wasn't built in a day. But um, to think about the elements there that we could learn from, um, uh, the things that might have been the ingredients to going from having a headless monster through right. to <laughs> now having a really successful academy program. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's a different culture. Endowment is a much bigger um, mm. part of the culture there. We don't have that to, to the same extent. But to right. think about other ways that we can support priorities for us uh, was something that might be a much more targeted and specific sort of collaboration. Okay, uh, it's seven o'clock now. Um, group four, anything else from group four? Brian? No, no that was Nora. Us. Oh, Thank no. you. Okay. So uh, is Brian Jolly still online? Brian? No, he had to go, but we spoke briefly. Um, okay. No, no, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bunmi, anything to add before we? Um, no. Not really, except to say that um, within Achieve, we've actually been considering planning to implement the uh, recognition of um, excellence in teaching hmm. awards this year. So. I guess it's in line with what has been discussed. Yeah. Thanks. That's great to hear from me. So any, any, any last minute comments from anybody? Brian? No, I think just uh, something I reflected on in our small group discussion is um, the great things that are being done through Achieve and the Academy. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's great to look at where we, you know, <laughs> really terrific vision there but also um remembering that uh we we're, we're doing some good things towards each of those sorts of areas mm. um supporting our clinical educators this is one initiative but also the great things being done by achieve as a group particularly uh around the core themes and pillars of achieve and that's um that's great and important to promote across the academy as well that there are activities that I, I'm, I'm guessing when we people can connect into those and participate in them as clinicians. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. Sorry, Bunmi. I was just responding to Brian and saying yes. I think maybe ensuring more synergies. Mm. Um, yeah, between the two groups. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think uh, one of the things I have. I've learned today also is from apart from all these things, it'll be good to get some funding too. So, uh, Kuli, if you can give me the number of your finance guy, I would like to <laughs> <laughs> happy to help in any way I can. But, um, and you know, I think my email address is on the announcement. 
<laughs> is on the announcement field. I've, I'd welcome any questions or comments or communications for all, any of you. And just, I'm, I'm very passionate about being a clinician educator. Uh, that's my love. And, and I just really appreciate, again, you're all taking the time out in your Monday evening uh, to be here today. And uh, thank you again. Can I just add one thing? I think, Kichu, um, uh, uh, thinking back, one of the things that was a bit of a catalyst for us thinking about having an academy here was one of our own from from uh, the university who'd been at the University of California in San Francisco and said, oh, they've got this thing called an academy of clinical educators yes. there. And um, that sparked a discussion. And I think it was Andrew Boyle who'd, who'd worked at uh, UCSF who talked yeah. about that. So um, you, we, we, we have a legacy to honour there cue that um, it sparked our interest in a similar type of structure to support and recognize our clinical teachers in some way and bring them into what is now our sort of achieve sort of framework, but to ensure that we're supporting them and recognizing the invaluable work they do. So thank you all. And thank you in particular, Q Ching Li for spending your time with us and thank you. spending a few weeks here with us and stimulating us. And thank you everybody for joining tonight. And we have, I've taken notes and it's recorded this one. Yes. So I'll take some more notes and uh, try to do some, some of the suggestions uh, which came up uh, from the group discussion today. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.